Thinking for sin I don't Nothing but the blood of Jesus Lord of good that I have done Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh precious is the flow But the blood of Jesus, nothing 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 but the blood of Good morning, church. Let's keep singing. Let us sing Bent on Conquest.
I would see him. Every tongue confesses his name, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the same. Gather around to listen. What the Holy Spirit says, giving us a victory. It's coming with the clouds someday. Come, Lamb of God, triumph and conquer. Hands on conquest for the glory of your name. Come, Lamb of God, just like you promised. Send all your angels, deliver us today. Overpowered in heaven, battle rages on this day. Mark fought the dragon, leading all the world astray. Though we may be shaken, we will never be ashamed. It's giving us a kingdom, it's coming with the clouds someday. Come, Lamb of God, triumph and conquer. Hands on conquest for the glory of your name. Come, Lamb of God, just like you promised. Send all your angels to deliver us today. You are worthy, take the scroll, you brought us with your blood. Holy, holy is the Lord who was and is to come. You are worthy. You brought us with your blood. Holy, holy is the Lord who was and is to come. Come, Lamb of God, triumph and conquer, and for conquest for the glory of your name. Come, Lamb of God, just like you promised. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday service of the Melbourne Church of Christ. Amen. Today is going to be a special service. You know, uh, just to introduce myself, I, I see uh, different faces today. Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, June Pablo. Uh, I, I song lead. I'm also the uh, in-house comedian of the Melbourne Church of Christ. Yeah. Let's, let's do that again. Comedian of the Melbourne Church of Christ. Yeah. Thank you very much. But today is a special service. Amen? It, today we're going to do our yearly Hope Day of Giving. This is our chance to be like Christ. To look after those who cannot look after themselves and to look after each other. It's going to be packed. We have a special speaker for today. I'll let Mark do the others. But let us go to God in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your presence. You honor us with your presence. We thank you that you first gave to us, and with that, we can give to others. I pray that uh, we follow the example uh, that uh, was set before us when Jesus fed the 5,000. From so little, he has multiplied so much. All he needed was our hearts, God. We give them to you today. Please be with every part of the service. May they be a great offering to you, God. Please be with David as he speaks, and, and as well, uh, open our minds and our hearts to it. We rejoice, God, that you are here with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all have our seats. Oh. Oh. We're, we're going to sing a song, so oh, please sorry. stand. <laughs> He's a true... 
He's a true comedian, isn't he? Good morning, everyone. Thanks, song leaders. Uh, June did forget to say that he's the, also the chair of the Hope Worldwide board. Um, so he keeps me um, doing things that are not so risky, like traveling to remote, remote places. Um, OK, I'm just going to see if I can use this clicker. Yes. So uh, first of all, we'll start off with some announcements. Uh, so we have hubs this week. Um, and you've got the preteens nothing this Friday, is that right? Preteens none, yeah. Teens 7:30 at uh, Mary Kehoe uh, campus worship night and Yopro's retreat. I think over in Perth, I believe Melissa is already there, so she sent sent these announcements from Perth. Um, then we have um, East uh, service next week, uh, as well as the West. And coming up in June, we've got a women's night. So look forward to the women's night. Now, I haven't been given uh, any welcomes from anyone. So if you're visiting, uh, don't feel that you're forgotten. You're truly loved. And welcome to the Melbourne Church of Christ. Um, so this is a, our annual Hope uh, Day of Giving. So it's an annual fundraiser. 
Um, so we're doing things a little bit differently today. Um, so I'm going to share uh, about where the funds that... So the appeal opens in April this month, but it's open till the rest of the year. So there are opportunities. You don't have to just give today, uh, but it does fund our priority programs. Um, after we talk a little bit about hope, we'll have a break. Um, there are some brochures as well, so you can take one away, maybe pass it on to some friends and family if they want to contribute as well. Uh, and then we'll come back uh, for a sermon followed by communion by Dave. So I'll give Dave a little introduction just before he speaks. So to, in terms of just thinking about um, the church and hope, one of the things that I'm always mindful of is that back in the, uh, the late 80s, um, some disciples in, uh, in the London church got together and through their studies of the scriptures, they came up with a little book called I Was Hungry and realized that we're not doing enough to help the poor. And the scriptures are full of um, examples of, of helping the poor and God's heart for the poor. And as a result, that's how Hope Worldwide came together. So again, it was disciples uh, loving each other and also going out to meet the needs of the poor, helping the poor as part of our discipleship and spreading the good news of Jesus everywhere. So I think it's good just to remember um, that sort of, you know, why, why we have uh, effectively a charity that's connected to our churches globally. Um, one of the scriptures I think is important to remember in terms of as we think about the poor, um, Jesus uh, starts off in the Beatitudes. Um, one of the first things he says in chapter 6 is, verse 3, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And so this attitude that when we give, it's not about us, it's not about um, blowing our own trumpet, it, it's not about acknowledging and thinking about what we're doing, because we're very quick to either um, give with one hand and quickly take back, <laughs> or quick quickly to sort of um, recognize our own, own ability and get a bit prideful about our giving. And so it's very much it's between us and God. And I think let's just make sure we have that heart of giving to those in need. And again, Jesus says here, when we give, it's not if, it, it is something that we need to do as part of being disciples. Uh, the other scripture that comes to mind is in Acts 9, verse 36 to 37. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. Uh, she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. And so this um, disciple who was known as um, Dorcas, Tabitha, so I think the Greek, it's a gazelle, this sense of being able to be active and uh, go and serve and do good. And that's what she was recognized for, always doing good and helping the poor. And it's interesting that she was one of the few people that was resurrected from the dead. And again, the, the disciples were so in love with her, they just couldn't stand her not being there. And she was brought back to life again. But I think it's a great example of a Christian and their service. And the fact that they were doing good, they were uh, looking after their spiritual family, and helping the poor. And I think it's a good reminder of the hearts that we need to have as we serve. It does remind me of this, this sister um, and her brother there. So the sister is Tolu. Um, she actually passed away last Sunday, just about half an hour after church. And I got to meet her. Um, she had a weak, she had a heart condition and she was really on borrowed time. I was surprised then getting the message that she just passed away because when I looked at, you know, I, I was writing her a letter because she wanted to go to the singles retreat in Perth and couldn't, you know, I said, no, you're not fit to travel. So I wrote her a letter and, and then half an hour later, I got a call that she'd actually passed away at home, happy. And she'd prayed in the morning that um, God would send her a, a doctor to, to just give her some guidance. So she was very excited that I told her to change her diet and do some healthy things. Um, but also knowing that her heart condition couldn't, couldn't really be fixed. Um, she was so encouraged by Dave's um, sermon, felt like her service was noted by God. And 
Um, she was laughing and joking, having some cucumber, and then lay down and died. Um, and I, say, I share this because I think, her, she, you know, she was someone who, who loved the disciples, loved the poor. She was always going to serve others. She spent like a week in the Hope office uh, preparing for their gala dinner, sleeping on a mat. She was always doing acts of kindness. And so as I was privileged enough to go to her grieving ceremony, there was a lot of emotion, but also a lot of joy. And so again, and she, this brochure that's up there, she actually put that one together. But again, that's the heart of a Christian, and I think that's the heart that we all need to have as well. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the HOPE programs. Um, so again, we, we start the, um, the appeal this month, and the goal is for about $40,000 um, to be raised this year. Um, so we have four kind of main areas. So we have um, primary health care in Papua New Guinea. Um, then we have primary education in Papua New Guinea, and then we're supporting vulnerable communities in, Fiji's, in Fiji as well as primary education. in Papua New Guinea. Um, so you can see the Nine Mile Clinic is the busiest clinic. I, that photo I took on Monday, Monday morning, and there's like three or 400 people wanting to be seen every day there, and the staff are actually quite overwhelmed. Um, it's too much for them to handle. Um, then if you go to the remote areas, again, there's very, very basic health care um, and pretty much nothing. So. It was great to see volunteers, a lot from Melbourne, go out at the end of through the, the school program. And the other cool thing is um, actually delivering the school books out to the remote areas where a lot of the schools just have no books at all. Um, then moving over to Fiji. I know in December, uh, a number of volunteers, including the Stakovich family, went over to um, Fiji to serve, to build homes, to work in one of the high, high schools, the boarding school that was closed and needed repairs. And that was actually fixed up and that was opened um, just, uh, I think, a couple of months ago as well. So you can see the picture on the... Is that your left or right?
Yeah, Father in heaven, uh, thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us life. Uh, thank you for giving us opportunities to give. Uh, thank you for establishing Hope Worldwide many years ago. Thank you that we have an organization that we can donate to and to contribute to the needs of those um, who are uh, desperate and distressed. And thank you that you want us to be a comfort for those um, who are feeling um, distressed and hopeless, then we can bring hope to them. And so just ask that you um, allow us to raise the funds that we need, allow it to reach the people that need help, and help the people who benefit also to see your love through, uh, through the work of Hope Worldwide in PNG, in Fiji, and other places um, that Hope operates. And give us as, as your children um, the love for other people, the love for the poor, and to really show Jesus' heart. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to have just a short break, and I'll come back after a minute, sing a song, and then we'll welcome our speaker. Please, thank you.
introduction. I think there was a... Oh, that's right, somebody's birthday. Um, so Jenny Whitelaw's birthday. So we'll continue with tradition. Where is, where is Jenny? Oh, there you are, okay. Who's, who's good at singing happy birthday? Come, June. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll ruin this. So. All right. Remember, he's just a doctor. Okay. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jenny. Happy birthday to you. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Happy birthday, Jenny. Um, I think that was all the... Oh, yes. Um, we're going to have these today, so because I think... I don't know, something didn't come through for the normal trays. Uh, so grab one of these um, for after the sermon. We'll have communion together. Let me introduce Dave. So Dave... Um, Really, I've seen him in, in different conferences, but not really got some time with him. So this uh, recent trip to Papua New Guinea, where I kind of ditched the, the team of uh, Brett, Jeanette, Abby, uh, Luke, uh, who else was there, and a lot of locals, and I said, you guys go and explore. I'm going back. But I got a few days just to, to meet Dave, and wow, what a, what a gentle, humble, um, kind, compassionate man. So definitely was something um, that was great to experience. Um, he's the Chief Operating Officer of Hope Worldwide Global, and so he helps with overseeing um, over, so it's about 60 countries where Hope operates, and providing support, um, and even things like providing water filters to where they need them in Papua New Guinea. Um, so prior to that, um, he was doing, so I think it's about a year now you've been, or less than a year you've been doing the yeah. operating. Uh, prior to that, he was doing all the disaster relief, so was in places like Ukraine, helping out there. Uh, and prior to that, he was working as a firefighter. Um, so again, a lot of activity, a lot of danger, uh, but a lot of faith and love that he's been able to show over the years. He was baptized in 1988 in Illinois, America, um, to, uh, married to his wife, Angela. And you can tell he really loves his wife because the Hope team was saying, yeah, he could just not stop talking about Angela as he was in remote parts of Pap Papua New Guinea. Uh, served as an elder uh, for, a number, for many years um, before moving this last year to Atlanta to take on the role to manage um, the operations of Hope Worldwide globally. So I'm very excited to introduce him, uh, listen, learn, and uh, I think, yeah, definitely become more Christ-like because of the words that he'll share from God's Word. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good morning, Australia. The entire country. The entire country. Um, it is an honor to be here. I just have a fun fact. I was actually born in Melbourne. Melbourne, Florida. But I really was born in Melbourne. And I really, June, I really want the title as the comedian of the church. I don't think I'm going to get it, but the self-appointed title is church comedian. That is a great title. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you today. And I want to bring you greetings from all the employees at Hope Worldwide in Atlanta, where our global headquarters is. Uh, we've been there for about, uh, right around COVID, about three years ago. But prior to that, we were in San Diego, California. And prior to that, many of you know we were in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for a very long time. That's where Bob and Pat Gimpel kind of started the Hope Worldwide uh, organization. And as you, if you've been around for a long time, there were three original projects at Hope Worldwide, and that was 33 years ago. Mexico City, uh, projects in India and a leper colony, and uh, HIV work in the Ivory Coast in Africa. All three of those programs are still going strong today after 33 years. And that is amazing. And from a message of compassion, Hope Worldwide has grown into operations in 61 different countries around the world. 
we have combined, when you put all the Hope Worldwide together, there are over 2,000 employees and around 20,000 volunteers that do, every day go and just serve Amen. and bring the heart of Jesus around the world. And I am so proud. As a COO, I just can't tell you how proud I am of all of those employees and volunteers who just love Jesus and want to share the compassion of Christ. Amen? Amen. It is just, as I said, an honor. In 2023, those volunteers and staff gave over one million hours of their time. And they served over one million people in 2023 around the world. And that number is a big number when you think about it. Hope Worldwide is very broad in many countries, and we are a fairly small in terms of financial resources in the grand scheme of NGOs, uh, but we are powerful in heart. Uh, and I'm just excited to be there. Mark mentioned that I was uh, an elder in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, I got a call one day from my son who was a pretty decent athlete, and uh, he said, Dad, man, I just got what they call in America schooled in basketball, which means he got beat ugly by somebody named Alex, right? And I thought it was Alex who I've known since, like, and I'm like, man, Will, how did you get beat by Alex? I know he's not an athlete. And it wasn't that Alex, it was Alex Whittinger, who's a pro basketball player, and I don't know if she's here today, but I hope she is, so I want to see her. But Alex Whittinger was in Champaign. She was a star basketball player. She's, at, playing, she's playing today, so I'm so sorry that I'm not going to be able to see her. But uh, I got to meet Alex. I'll never forget her coming over to our house and uh, climbing the tree in our backyard at a campus bonfire. And I was thinking the whole time, Alex, don't fall out of the tree because the basketball coach at the university was not going to like me if you fell out of that tree. So, but Alex, is I'm so encouraged to hear that she's doing great and, and is here in Melbourne. That's amazing. My family sends their greetings, and I, I, since they talked about Angela, that's actually Atlanta, Georgia. It's 15,582 kilometers from here, which is a long airplane ride. It's actually three long airplane rides, which I'm going back tomorrow. So uh, if you've never been to Atlanta, it's a great city. Uh, we are learning to love it because we just recently moved there last October. Um, we are blessed to have, since I got to talk about Angela and P&G, my wife Angela and I, I met this beautiful young woman when I was 20 years old and she was 18 and we've been married for 40 years this June. And we have two great children, Sarah and William, and we added a third great child in December, and that is Alexandra in the middle. And that is a beautiful part of the desert in Arizona where we lived for about a year. My kids still live in northern Arizona, so uh, it is great to have all three of my kids be disciples of Jesus. They've all been on various journeys, like most of our kids and us personally have been on uh, with Christ, but they are all disciples of Jesus, and it is so fun to watch our kids as adults do life. And if you're a parent of an adult child doing life, it's just amazing to watch. Uh, it's so fun this week to spend time with the Benny family and to just watch the interactions with mainly Lou because Jordy wasn't able to go with us, but that was a, it was a great fun time to do that. And I just uh, want to lift them up as parents and of servants because they were great and it was an honor to spend time with them. So we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about transformation this morning. And I want to talk about a few transformations in my life that have literally transformed me into who I am today and have changed me in ways that I can't even sometimes get my head around. In Romans chapter 12, if you would turn your Bibles, your iPhones, your iPads, or whatever you use, uh, would you turn to Romans 12 and verse 1 through 2? I remember preaching one time, I had a leather Bible, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, I am so glad you used the Bible. I'm like, you usually use the Bible, but um, it was the fact that I had a leather Bible in my hand. They were excited about the Bible, but uh, I didn't uh, want to carry it because it would have got really soaking wet on the rivers of Pope, Papua New Guinea this week. So, uh, so Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. My first transformation that I want to talk about today happened in July of 1988. I was an enlisted person in the United States Air Force. Uh, I've been married for four years. It was not going well. Uh, Angela was 18 when we got married. I was 20. When our daughter turned 18, I went, oh, heavens, no. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were children when we got married. And uh, we carried a lot of child baggage into our marriage. We partied a lot. We were on the road to divorce. There was no question in my mind that we were not going to last. In fact, we probably both told each other, you know, we'll try this marriage thing for a little while, see what happens. And that was probably our mindset going into uh, being young and married. We loved each other, but that was, you know, at our limited understanding. Someone knocked on our best friend's door and invited them to come to a church. I had been to many churches. I grew up going to churches. I grew up going to church every Sunday. I also grew up partying every Saturday night. I, I went, partied every Friday night. But I still went to church on Sunday morning. I was the president of the youth group, which meant really nothing, but it meant <laughs> that I was supposed to be someone who was trying to live my life according to Jesus. I had been saved literally hundreds of times. Amen. If you think about that one for a minute. And I was not living a life of Christ. But someone knocked on a friend's door. They went to a church and they said, hey, can you come with us next time because this church is kind of different and we're not sure. So we went the next week with them. And I remember them asking a question. Actually, three questions. Ask my wife and a, a friend, hey, what's the top three things in your life? And this friend said, well, I'm trying to make God, my husband, and my kids. My wife laughed at her when she said that. We've no, we were so drunk two weeks ago, we know you're not trying to make your husband your, your, your number one. We know that's not true. But they said that, she said, and they had been to the church once. So we went the next morning. Next morning, I started learning. And the next week, we invited a friend with us. So the six of us went. And about three weeks later, guess what? We all got baptized into Christ. Amen. We studied the Bible. We, we loved it. And what changed me was not necessarily the scriptures. Because I had read the scriptures before. What changed me the most and what transformed me was seeing people live the life of a disciple. It was seeing people who, unlike me, who didn't just go on Sunday morning. On Friday night, they were living the life of Christ. On Tuesday afternoon, they were living the life of Jesus. And it transformed me in ways that I still, 36 years later, can't explain. I saw a young family. We were, like I said, our marriage was bad. I saw a young family with kids. And we were hoping to have kids. But I saw this young family as we were studying the Bible and their children obeyed them. <laughs> yes, their children, their teen, their 13-year-old obeyed them. I was like, this is, this is wrong. Something's crazy here. <laughs> so we got baptized. We found out Angela was pregnant with Sarah, our oldest, the day I got baptized. So it was an amazing time of transformation in so many ways. But see, friends, my mind needed renewed. My mind needed to be transformed because I had a warped thinking about church. I had a warped thinking about what Jesus was calling us to do. But by studying the word with people who are committed to following Christ, I changed. And I want to challenge you, if you're visiting today with you, welcome, number one. 
but open the scriptures. Ask the person who say, hey, you want to go to church with me? Ask them, hey, what transformed you into who you are today? And let the scriptures and let life transform you. Let Jesus' blood transform you. My second transformation really started several years later. I had been in the church for many years at that point. I was growing. I was leading Bible studies. I was leading about three, I was probably leading 30% of our church at the time in Illinois. Uh, We were baptizing people. We were fruitful. We were loving God. But I began to feel that there was a hole in my heart. And I couldn't, ex- I couldn't put my mind what it was. I was like, okay, I'm doing all the right things. But there's something missing. There was something that just wasn't quite right with the gospel that I was living. And it wasn't that I was this sinful person that was hiding stuff. It was just something going on that I w- couldn't put my fingers around. And mind you, at this point, I felt like... I was a doer. I felt like I was a serving person. Every job I've ever had has been about service. My first job as a 16-year-old kid was a lifeguard. I went in the military. I was a firefighter for 30 years. All those are serving others' jobs. I was literally willing to go into a burning building to save someone else's life, to sacrifice my own if needed. So I had the heart in my mind to serve. But there was a hole. There was something that just wasn't right. I went to a hope trip in Guatemala, which is a country in Central America. Uh, I went to Guatemala in 2011. And what transformed me was seeing poverty for the first time. I really believe that I had seen American level poverty before, which I had. I'd seen inner city struggles. I'd seen people, the results of murder. I had seen the results of horrible things uh, that people did to each other. I had seen evil and the results of that in my career. But I had never witnessed poverty at that level. I went, my wife and I, by all standards, are middle class as they come. And that, you know, we, I'm, I don't apologize for that. That's just who we were. We were middle class, middle income people in America. Um, we were with a small medical team. We were walking down a railroad community where Hope Worldwide sponsored a school. And we're just kind of going down to where we're going to do this clinic. And there were some shanties, some little tin shacks along this railroad community. And I, I, so I asked the brothers, hey, so what's, what's the story here? And there was a little cart outside that somebody was selling something. And they said, oh, well, that's, they're, they were selling something to make their living. Maybe it was a little snack, a little piece of fruit. And they're living there. And I said, so how many people live there? And he said about six to eight people live in this three meter by three meter place. I could, I, it, it just floored me. I'm like, wait a minute. The ensuite bathroom in my bedroom at my house at the time was bigger than that home for six to eight people. I couldn't get my heart around it. I couldn't get my mind around it that that was real. And one after another. And that began to change me. Also on that trip, a young woman came in the first day of the clinic. And she was about that big around I had never seen anybody in at that point about 25 years of of being a firefighter who was that frail who didn't die a few days later. She came. She passed out while waiting in line for the clinic. We started an IV on her. She got a little bit revived. She came back the next day with a bag of oranges to say thank you. Every person in that team, their family income was probably over $100,000 combined. Every one of them. Doctors and nurses and two-income families. And this woman brought a bag of oranges to say thank you. I could not comprehend that level of gratitude and that level of poverty. And it reminded me instantly of the widow with the two coins who gave everything she had. Just to say thank you 
and it changed my trajectory of my life. I started praying after that moment about what my life would look like in the future. I knew I was going to be able to retire as a firefighter in my mid-50s, because that's uh, firefighting is a young person's game. Um, it's, I'm, I'm getting a little bit old for that. Um, but I knew that, and I was like, okay, how can I change my life? I started praying about right then, what can I do in the future? And that set me on a course to be where I'm at today with Hope Worldwide. I volunteered in Guatemala several times and then was hired in 2018 to oversee our disaster response programs. But what changed me was praying and a response to poverty. I started studying what poverty was all about in the scriptures. That was the whole. I had missed it completely. I had missed that there was this giant part of the gospel that I wasn't living, even though I felt like I was a giving person. I didn't have the heart behind it. And when I, as part of my studies, I found these truths in Scripture. Turn to Acts chapter 3. And we're going to just kind of paraphrase Acts 3, 1 through 10 and, and 4. So our prayers and acts of kindness draw attention to God. In Acts chapter 3, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at a time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. It was part of their daily normal life to pray. Friends, that's where it begins. If we are not praying as a regular part of our life, in fact, and those times, it was multiple times a day in a very regimented way. Three o'clock in the afternoon was the time to pray. I'm blessed to be part of a group that sets their alarm at three o'clock every day. And it's a rolling prayer around the world. So at three o'clock, I say a little prayer. And so every time someone in a different time zone around the world, guess what? Around the clock, there's somebody praying at three o'clock in the afternoon. And it's, re it's really cool to think about when that thing. So Peter and John were praying. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. This man was known. This man was known by Peter and John. I don't know if you have this here in Australia, but in America, there's often a person on the corner with a sign asking for some kind of help. That, I, I honestly haven't been here, so I don't really know if that's common here or not. But what's that? Yeah, so it is totally, he was known to Peter and John. And he was known to anyone who's around. He asked, the, the man asked, Peter said, look at us. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Moving forward, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging. Peter and John prayed. They gave a gift of healing to a man. And then something incredible happened. It would have been easy to say, yeah, we did that. Yeah, a Hope for Hawaii Australia gave $40,000 to P&G. You did that. No, that's not what happened. First thing that happened, Peter and John noticed the man. They called him out, told him what they were going to do. And then in Acts chapter 4, as oftentimes happens, when we do something, when something good happens, it gets noticed. Sometimes by the wrong people, right? In this case, it got noticed by the high priest. They were greatly disturbed in, in Acts chapter 4 because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They were so upset, they seized Peter and John, put them in jail for the night. Whoops. I don't know about you, I've not been in jail quite yet. Um, but, yeah, I made the days early, so uh, I, did, I did get stopped in customs yesterday, so it was close. <laughs> I, I said that for you guys. Wow. Somebody gave me beetle nuts as a result in... in um, as, as a celebration, they gave me a name in the community and gave me, and I thought I had given them all away to the, the guards that were cleaning us. Nope, there were four or five of them in the little bag they had, and I tried to import those into Australia yesterday, unbeknownst to myself, which don't do that. 
But I didn't get thrown in jail, so I'm, I'm actually sanitizing this story so that the Bennies don't have any good ammunition on me anymore. <laughs> but it was fun. <coughs> they were asked, by what power or what name did you do this? And Peter and John said this. Rulers and elders of the people, in verse 9 of chapter 4, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame or being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ whom you crucified. It is in the name of Jesus Christ who you crucified but which God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. So there was a prayer, there was an act of kindness, and there was glory to God. That's the model. Pray, give, give glory to God. Amen? You see, God does big things as a result of prayer and gifts to the poor. Acts chapter 10. How many of you know that you were here today because of a prayer and a gift to the poor? You know, because I preached it last week, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're here. You are able to hear the gospel of Jesus because of a prayer and a gift to the poor. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, who was not friendly to the Jews, in fact, he was considered the enemy. He was a Roman centurion. But he was a devout man, and he prayed, and he gave gifts to the poor. And the angel came and said in Acts chapter 10, your gifts to the poor and your prayers have come up to him as a memorial offering. So God heard those prayers. God heard those gifts to the poor. And what happened? Peter came to the house, stayed there, this was not done, my friends. The Jews and the Gentiles, uh-uh, it wasn't done. But it was then. So you as Gentiles, unless you're uh, an Israelite, you didn't hear the gospel. But the gospel was ushered in because of a prayer and a memorial offering. Amen. So big things happen. It's a pretty big thing that we're all here today, right? 2,000 years later, that we're able to hear the gospel, that we're able to be part and unified in hearing the gospel message. That's a pretty big thing. That simple act of prayer and a gift to the poor brought the message to each one of us. My friends, a life of service is what we are called to be and do scripturally. In Acts chapter 2, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, says that all scripture is breathed from God and has a purpose to teach, rebuke, tra train, correct, and righteousness, right? So that the man or person of God may be thoroughly equipped to do good works. The scriptures have a purpose to equip us to do good work. In Ephesians 2, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared in his advance for us to do. We are literally created to serve. We're created to serve. And that service has been prepared for us in advance. I'm so grateful that we have a God who prepares things for us, who sets things up for us. You know, it's not a coincidence that the last recorded major message in the Bible of Jesus was about service. In fact, two days, we just celebrated Easter, right? Two days before Jesus went into Jerusalem, on Palm Sunday, two days he preached this message in Matthew 25. Turn to Matthew 25 if you would. It's two days. Imagine Jesus standing at the Mount of Olives 
leaving the temple and looking at the temple in Matthew 24 saying, every one of these big stones is going to be brought down. And then on in Matthew 24, the, the parable of the ten virgins being prepared. And the whole two chapters about being prepared for the future. And in Matthew 25, you've heard the story. He stood at the Mount of Olives and tells of a great shorting of sheep and goats. He stands in the very place he looked over Jerusalem and wept. He stood there looking and he says to those on the right, come and receive your inheritance. For I was, in, in verse 31 through 46, for I was hungry and you gave the king food. He was thirsty and he gave the king something to drink. He had been a stranger and they welcomed the king into their homes. The king needed clothes and they gave him clothes. He was sick and they took care of him and he was in prison and they visited him. I can imagine the disciples just kind of giving this dumbfounded stare like, we've been with you three years. What are you talking about? We never gave you clothes. We might have bought you a cup of coffee up on time. We never gave you clothes. We never visited you in prison. What are you talking about? And then Jesus turned the world around by looking over and said, whatever you did for the least of these people, from a mountain overlooking Jerusalem, whatever you did for the least of these people, you did for me. Whatever you did for the wretched, whatever you did for the poor, the pitiful, the sick, the hungry, whatever you did for the child that was alone, Whatever you did for the widow who didn't want to go on anymore. Whatever you did for the adulterer, for the sinner, for the murderer. Whatever you did for the oppressed. Whatever you did for the one who is different than you. Whatever you did for the one who didn't have the same political views as you. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. That's powerful. And it sets the world on end. And it turns us upside down. And you know the rest of the story because then he says to those on his left, if you didn't do those things, the end is not good for you. This was two days before he went into Jerusalem when he said these things. The last thing he said. This is the only place in the Bible that I'm aware of that there could be considered a final test kind of put in those terms. He said, if you did these things, sheep. If you did those things, goat. You know, there's a couple other places. Malachi does say, test me in this. But this is a powerful scripture. I personally believe my own theology, that, I, that my own studies have been where Matthew 25 and Matthew 28, going to make disciples, where those two intersect, that's where we should be operating as churches. Amen. That's where we as Christians should be operating where those two intersect because they're not separate in any way, shape, or form. Baptizing somebody and serving somebody, there's no separation scripturally in those two. You know, this last week, I feel like there's another transformation coming. I don't know what it is yet. It is really hard to get around what I saw in P&G. Like I said, I've seen poverty before. I saw terrible poverty in, in, in Guatemala, in Honduras. I've traveled with Hope Worldwide in 25 or 26 countries. And the warmth, the love, the conditions, the people I saw this week are forever in my heart. And I really don't know what the transformation is. I'm trying to wrap my heart around it. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. You know, in 2019, Priscilla came to America to a HOPE conference. I just handed her, we had just started a partnership with some water filter, uh, a water filter group. 
and I handed her a bag of water filters to bring back to P&G. I had no concept in my mind. None. I didn't even imagine. This, you're talking about more than I asked or imagine. I didn't even imagine what would happen this week. To go down that river and to the first person, the picture uh, of the man, that's one of the water filter buckets. We pulled up in the river. We went down the Sepik River, turned right, and the water that you don't see was black as coal. It was black. It was like the blackest cup of coffee you'd ever seen. And that's not necessarily bad, but there are parasites in the water around the world in the warm climates, uh, in the tropics. Parasites will kill you. Waterborne diarrhea, waterborne illnesses will kill you. And they do. Thousands of people around the world every day in the tropics. That water to the, in the jug, he had filtered through that water. And I don't know if you've ever seen the demonstration. It's, it's like as clean as any bottled water you ever had. And to see that man come out and to say, my family doesn't have diarrhea anymore. They had, we even, we even saw that Hope PNG has installed like 1,200 water filters. In one community, they had in, in 2022, 700 cases of waterborne illness and waterborne diarrhea. 700. In 2023, they had three cases. That is a miracle. That is a modern miracle. And again, I don't know what the transformation will be. I don't know what it will be for me. I don't know what it will be for Hope Worldwide. I do know this. I will never forget that man. I will never forget those children who sang to us as we pulled into that village, knowing that they were going to get clean water perhaps for the first time in their life. They probably didn't even know what clean water was. But I know what. They knew that they were sick often. And the regional governor who we met with on Monday wants to bring 5,000 water filters. And my team right now is putting together the shipment of 5,000 water filters. His words, not mine, his words. This solves the problem of clean water along the Sepik River. Solves it. How does that happen besides God? It doesn't. It only happens because of God. Sorry. To each and every one of you, Hope Worldwide needs you. Hope Worldwide P&G needs you. Hope Worldwide Fiji needs you. Those children need you. I want to thank you for coming alongside Hope for 33 years. Some of you, how many of you have been around our church family for 33 years? Not a whole lot because this is a young congregation, amen, right? So probably 30% maybe. I want to say thank you to each one of you who have prayed, given, sacrificed, done anything to help advance that cause of serving the poor. Because it is not Hope Worldwide's cause, it is Jesus' cause. God willing, we will have many more years where we have over a million beneficiaries. And I, I pray that we will continue to grow that number. Well, what can you do, though? Sometimes we sit in our middle-class home with a good-sized bathroom, like I did, and we don't know what to do. Well, you can participate. Simple as that. You can go on a trip, or you can participate here in your backyard. In fact, this might be a controversial statement, and I'm not afraid of those because I've said it many times. If you go on a trip but you don't serve here, just don't come on the trip. Come on. Okay? And I'm the one that's in charge of the trips. All right? You understand where I'm going there? 
Serve in your backyard. Because it will make that much more encouraging and inspiring when you go serve abroad. Advocate. So participate. Advocate. Pray for what's going on around the world. Talk about it. Talk about, man, I'm, you know, this guy Mark Timlin told me about this cool thing going on in the P&G. You want to gift with it? You want to go with me sometime? Now, don't show them the pictures of the spiders in the forest. They might not go. But don't show my wife those pictures either. But, um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so advocate and donate. Give your money and time. We all have time. Not all of us have money. But we all have some time, whether it's this big or this big. We have time. Okay? I want to close with a little different telling of Matthew 25. Let's talk about what hope's doing globally. Perhaps when the king says, when I was hungry in 2023, you gave food to over 500,000 of me, including 300,000 Ukrainian me's. And in 75% of our global operations, you gave food. When I was thirsty, you gave water filters and clean water to over 2,500 families around the world, including the ones I talked about here in, in the South Pacific. When I was a stranger, you invited me in and gave me shelter through relational events because it is all about relationships. It's not about handing out. It's about coming alongside and sharing our lives and the gospel. You taught me how to be a better caregiver so that my child would flourish. You even taught me how to read. When I needed clothes, you clothed me and provided disaster relief supplies in six of the seven continents of the world. We're not in Antarctica yet. We'll get there. When I was sick, you took care of 420,000 of me. Around 90,000 of those in PNG. When I was in prison, you visited me and you helped me through mental health initiatives all around the world. Because that is a crisis. Mental health is a crisis around the world right now. For 2023, what you did for a million of the least of these, you did for me. But my friends, as we close today, the real transformation is not through the scriptures or an act of service. The real transformation is about the blood of Jesus. The transformation comes when we are washed in the blood of Jesus, when we accept the blood of Jesus, when we allow ourselves to come into that covenant relationship with the blood of Jesus. And I challenge and encourage each one of us today as we take communion, let's think about being transformed and renewed by the blood of the Jesus. It has been an honor to be with you this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we close this morning, we sometimes don't even understand what we are seeing. Our minds cannot wrap themselves around your power, your beauty, your strength, and your sacrifice of your son on the cross. But God, I pray that we can look at that sacrifice and, and accept the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness that comes from it and that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Father, I pray for the church here in Melbourne and throughout Australia that they will advance the gospel in ways that will just open their hearts and open their minds to what a joint life of service and seeking the saving of the lost can be. Father, we love you. I thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
you take communion, let us uh, sing shield about me. Final song, I'm just going to invite Vicky up. I'm going to say a few thank yous. First of all, I really want to thank all of you uh, in the Melbourne Church, your service. Uh, you have gone on trips, but also you do serve in the backyard as well. And I think pr pretty much everyone would stand up anyway, so I'm not going to ask you to stand up. But I know that so many of you have served in projects over the years, and I just want to say thank you so much for that. And secondly, um, Dave is off tomorrow morning. Uh, he got back after 10 p.m. last night. I'm sure he is very exhausted. He will be around uh, in the fellowship, so please come and have a chat with him. 
Uh, he'll be around outside, so uh, please meet with him afterwards. Uh, but do you want to just ask um, Dave to come up? We'll give you a, hand of a, a round of applause, and we'll give you some gifts. So this is uh, this your gift. So um, like you to just you can show people what you've got. Oh, there nice. you go. Is it? Uh, is this the right one? Is this the blues or the? Is this the right one? This is the right one. Okay. Well, we've also got a t-shirt for you. Sorry, Brett. Sorry. Nice. They didn't have any um, Tigers t-shirts, uh -oh. but we did get you for I Brett, for yeah, Brett yeah, and Jeanette, yeah, for the yeah, Bennies, that's nice. it. Nice. Um, don't, don't wear these together. Oh, don't okay? wear them together. Okay. No, they don't go together. I'm going to get in trouble again at the airport tomorrow. <laughs> That's tomorrow. right. And just a book about Australian adventures, oh, so yeah. we hope that you come back. I would love to. Amen. Yeah. I would love to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. The first thing I want to do is throw this this way. I know this is the wrong way to do it, but... Thank you. Amen. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dave. Let's all stand for our closing song. Let's sing. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes are out the store. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sweet sword. His truth is marching on. Yeah.